Um, when we talk about simple harmonic oscillator, let's see. Um, I guess this, um, so really the main thing is uh, something you saw in the lab. Um, so maybe it's possible that it's not quite possible to work, not exactly worth uh, doing it, but uh, well, I, we are here, so. So um, let me pause the simulation, start the clock, and start this oscillating for a bit. Okay. So it starts out with some, okay. Um, this amount of amplitude, which is represented the total amount of energy here. Let me measure one period. So uh, it goes up. And since I, it's a simulation, I have control over time. I'm going to actually measure uh, one period. So advancing frame by frame, where it appears to have stopped completely is basically, I think it's about here, okay. About 1.3 seconds, that's the period. And you can see that as it oscillates um, the, uh, so let me stop the timer here. It's, uh, um, the, that the potential energies are changing, kinetic energy is changing, and because I didn't get rid of the damping entirely, some of the energy is going into thermal energy. And here's one thing I want you to notice, is um, this uh, very, very relatively intricate interplay between this um, uh, potential combination of the gravitational and elastic potential energy, watch. So you see that um, as the mass goes up, elastic potential energy is decreasing. And now if you're just tracking elastic potential energy, elastic potential energy is at a minimum at the highest point where spring is as little compressed as possible. And you can describe this uh, motion that way, that's not wrong, but there is a simpler description that I was bringing up, bringing up during the lab. Um, watch this combination of potential energies and watch where the kinetic energy becomes maximum around the here. This is the equilibrium position of this mass spring system considering gravitational and elastic potential energy. And this is the position where this combination of these two potential energies is at a minimum value, allowing the kinetic energy to be maximum. If you go in either direction, if you go a little bit lower, then you will see that the increase in the elastic potential energy is great enough, greater, then the decrease in the gravitational potential energy that the combined sum increases, watch. It's increasing as you can see here. And on the way up, it's the same deal again. There's a point, oops, I, uh, all right, let me let it go down and back up. <laughs> so on the way up, there's a point at which kinetic energy is at a maximum and that makes the potential energy minimum around here. That's the equilibrium position. And as it goes up, the, even though the gravitational potential energy is increasing, the, um, wait, 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 wait. Even though the elastic potential energy is decreasing, gravitational potential energy is increasing enough that the combination of the potential energy is increasing as this mass moves away from the combined equilibrium point. So, um, and you can show all of this algebraically actually. Uh, uh, I don't think it's in, done in any of the videos that I've recorded. I'm, if someone were to ask, I'm happy to do it, but no one's asked recently. Um, so I think that's the one interesting thing about this. Uh, I guess one more thing to do here is to, um, you know, is to measure the period again with a different amplitude and just to ensure that, um, ensure that uh, it still remains at 1.3 seconds. So I guess somewhere around here is where 
the oscillation should be a lot smaller. Um, so I started the clock. Let me start the simulation. And once again, use my control over time to measure exactly one period. Okay, pause it here and slowly advance and stop it around where it's about to turn around. It's around here. Yeah, 1.3 seconds. Um, it doesn't matter whether you have a very, very large amplitude or a small amplitude. Yeah. Now, what I want you to show is that not all oscillations are simple harmonic oscillators. Mass on a spring, that's a kind of, uh, that's the model system where as long as the spring obeys Hooke's law, it's a simple harmonic oscillator for all amplitudes. Pendulum is a case where it is the, it is, it, uh, it can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator. Oops, I don't want this. I think I want this. Okay. Yeah, it can be approximated as simple harmonic oscillator only for small amplitudes. Watch. So here's a period timer. Let me use that to measure a period. Um, okay, I have no frictions. Okay, that's good. So at this very small amplitude, it says this is the period, 1.6787 seconds. And this depends on, um, it does not depend on mass, uh, interestingly enough. I mean, maybe not that interesting if you remember the formula for her natural oscillation frequency, omega is uh, equal to square root of g over L. Now, if you make the length longer, that does change the period. So now it's one point, it's not 2.0063 seconds, it's longer. Uh, remember the formula, omega is equal to square root of g over L. So you increase L, decrease angular frequency, which increases period. All good, okay. Now you want to test, is this a simple harmonic oscillator? So you make the oscillation amplitude larger. And you find that to your delight maybe that it's still about two seconds. But if you are very careful with it, then you can start to notice something. Let me write down the number, 2.0092. That's what the period is right now. And you will see that as I increase the amplitude, period ever so slightly changes. So 2.0092 to 2.0147, it is a such a small difference. It's only about 0 0.005, about five milliseconds difference. In a lot of the lab setup, it's possible that you don't measure this difference. So, all right, let's uh, make the difference more exaggerated. And let's uh, make the amplitude much larger. Then, now this is where your measurement methods maybe don't need to be so precise because you can see that the, now the period difference is 0.2 seconds. Um, most of the careful experimenters can spot that level of difference. In the lab, most of you are getting uh, uncertainty of about 0.1 second um, for your um, oscillation period. So if you, something like this says, like 0.2 second difference is something that you can definitely stop. Uh, spot. So this is where, um, if you were to see this in the lab, I would hope that you would wonder, how could this be? I mean, you know, the formula you are given says that omega is equal to square root of uh, g over L. Wow, that's so annoying. Let me just stop that. Uh, oops. Um, omega is equal to square root of g over L. So if you solve for period, it's a 2 pi over omega, so it should be 2 pi times the square root of L over G. And nowhere in this formula is amplitude involved. Um, so, so where is this coming from? This is where I would encourage you to, to go back to the textbook and actually uh, carefully go through the derivation of that um, of this formula, the angular frequency of pendulum oscillation. 
and that's where I hope you will find uh, what you may have missed the first time you read it uh, with this uh, perplexing uh, contradiction in mind. If you go back and look at the pendulum section and try to read through the derivation of this pendulum motion, then this is what I hope you will see. That the equation of motion for pendulum was actually this. It's a quite complicated equation of motion. There is no hope of uh, solving for this uh, analytically. Uh, second time derivative of a parameter is equal to minus some constant times trig function of the parameter. Um, it says advanced to calculus. I think there's probably a special function that's defined using this. Um, so, so what um, what the textbook has to introduce is the small angle approximation, which is pretty good for a lot of the angles. That's why you saw for small amplitude, the deviation, the change in the period was so small to be almost experimentally undetectable. But uh, what you should learn to spot as a good scientist and engineer is in which part of your derivation an approximation entered in. So that in case um, you uh, encounter situation where that approximation is no longer good, then you should know to uh, scratch the approximation, maybe uh, use a more uh, precise numerical formula or something. Since this approximation is a small angle approximation, uh, something like less than 15 degrees, then you should make sure that when you have something like, I don't know, this is 45, 50, 60 degrees, then you don't use small angle approximation. Or at least to be very aware that it can give you a result that's basically off by 10%. So, um, so this is a wonderful simulation to explore that it makes some of the tasks a lot easier because, um, well, period of clock. Yes, it, it, it eliminates the, the reaction time factor. Uh, 